like heart surgery is pretty violent. Like they kill you for 90 minutes. They cut your rib cage open. They physically kill you. They put you on a lung bypass machine. There's a machine that pumps the blood for you and does the breathing for you. It is not like a... Oh, man, this <laughs> story is making me so queasy. Oh. Welcome to the Mr. Bill Podcast. I'm Anand Harsh, editor-in-chief of the Unst.com and Bill's personal anesthesiologist. I've been producing and listening to podcasts for more than a decade, and I have never experienced something quite like today's episode. Uh, let me first set it up, and then I'll tell you what to expect. Uh, Bill's guest today is Richard Devine. This guy has done it all. He remixed Aphex Twin and Mike Patton, worked with BT, and has a resume longer than my arm in film, TV, commercial, and video game work. He even designed the interior and exterior sounds for the Jaguar I-Pace electric car. He is a sound designer's sound designer, and chances are you've seen his beautiful blinky modular synth setups that go viral on your socials that are truly aesthetic as fuck. Anyway, Richard's reputation speaks for itself, so I don't need to belabor the point here. What makes this episode especially interesting is that towards the end, Richard begins to describe an especially gruesome medical procedure, at which point Bill starts to get woozy. Ultimately, he suffers a vasovagal attack and ends up falling to the floor and splitting his head open. As you can imagine, the interview is pretty much over at that point. And while Bill's floor looks like a crime scene, he's doing okay and escaped with only four staples in his head. So as a trigger warning, perhaps, if you are prone to fainting, uh, maybe once Richard starts talking about his medical procedure, that might be a good place to end the episode for yourself. But the rest of you uh, sickos slash the intellectually curious, the Zoom video from this particular incident is captured in its full glory and up on the Patreon to all subscribers for the price of subscribing for as little as a dollar a month. Not only can you get early access to episodes and help support the show, but you can also enjoy sick shit like this. The sacrifices Bill makes for his patrons. If you're into the idea of uploading full video for each podcast to uh, the Patreon, please let us know in the Discord or in the Beleagle Immigrants Facebook group. I implore you to use your judgment uh, when deciding whether or not to watch that video. It's it's a little gross. Uh, finally, head over to MrBillsTunes.com to sign up to become a hardcore Ableton ear. We're currently running a production contest for Spectra, Bill's latest and most exhaustive sample pack that's open only to hardcore Ableton ear members and features some really sick prizes like a one-on-one -on -one session with Bill. Hey, maybe you will have the opportunity opportunity to make him pass out on a zoom call uh okay enjoy bill's chat with richard divine hey you're listening to the mr bill podcast hey you're listening to the mr bill podcast hey you are listening to the mr bill podcast hey you're 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 listening to the mr bill podcast cool awesome man well yeah thanks so much for doing this i really appreciate you um taking time out of your day to to come and chat with me yeah no problem yeah. Um, how's, yeah. How's your uh, day been? Have you just been working? Yeah, it's been a bit of a crazy day. <laughs> yeah. Working, being a parent, working while being at home with your kids is uh, definitely challenging <laughs> when you have an eight-year-old and a three-year-old. I don't know if you have kids. Um, it is definitely... Um, it can be hard at times, especially with COVID. My my son's school got shut down permanently. So we have to watch him, uh, until we find some other situation where we could, it, it, we had him set up in a Montessori school. That was really nice, but a couple days a week, we could drop him off there, but they, uh, they closed down. So now we're having to kind of juggle between being parents and, <laughs> and trying to work from home has been a challenge. And I know there's a lot of other parents out there that are in, 
similar situations to us, so they can probably <laughs> sympathize with me. It's, it's definitely hard to, to juggle everything at once, especially a three-year-old. My three-year-old son is gets into everything. He can't be left alone <laughs> for more than a minute. <laughs> He's like breaking stuff and, <laughs> you know, constantly trying to stick a screwdriver in like a electrical socket or, you know, <laughs> like trying to kill himself or kill somebody else. Or So it's one of those things uh, that can be, uh, it can just, yeah, like I said, it's just a extremely challenging time right now, but we're getting through it. <laughs> nice. Best, the best way that we can. <laughs> yeah, it's got to be tough with uh, creative work too, where like, um, you know, it takes a little while sometimes to get into the flow of things. And if you're having to constantly break your attention to deal with something else, it can be a little difficult to get into that flow. Oh, yeah. The kids will be fighting over stuff. They'll be, you know, banging at your door. I want a popsicle or my sister got a popsicle and I didn't get one. Give me one. You know, <laughs> the, these sorts of things are constantly happening, you know, every five minutes. So, yeah, it's it's definitely it's a it's a vastly different world than what I used to used to live previous to having kids where I had a lot more time to myself and. Um, you know, I didn't have to worry about two little creatures that I have to feed and make sure that they're <laughs> safe and they don't hurt themselves. And, um, but it's amazing. Yeah. Being a parent is really, uh, you know, I, I, I say that these make it sound like it's a negative thing, but it's really not. They're really amazing. They, they're just a lot of work and they're a lot more work just right now during this, this challenging time during the whole COVID mm. pandemic. And, um, but you know, hopefully that's going to change. I think I think within, you know, by the end of this year, I think we're going to get in a better place looking, you know, now looking at the vaccinations and sort of the stuff that's been taking place right now. We're hoping that we're all hoping, I think the situation's going to get better going forward. So, yeah, it's um, a little unfortunate that um, uh, like they performed a medical, like scientists performed this medical miracle of like coming up with a vaccine in a year and now, uh, people on like the gov uh sorry the um the local level are like having trouble getting all of these vaccines into people's arms before they you know go off because um like apparently with a vial of the vaccine once you open it you have to administer all 10 doses <clears throat> within like uh an hour or something like that uh and if you oh, don't wow. it, it just goes off so there's just like shitloads of vaccine just being wasted because they can't logistically or like they're having issues logistically like getting 10 people into like places at a time to administer these vials efficiently um and then countries like wealthy countries are just buying all of it basically like i, I know um the u.s bought uh enough vaccines to vaccinate the u.s two times over uh and oh then wow the UK bought enough to vaccinate their country three times over, and then Canada bought enough to vaccinate their country five times over. So, oh my gosh, yeah, I wasn't then, aware of these numbers. Hmm. Yeah, and then on, on top of that, it's like a lot of it's just getting wasted because they can't figure out how to deal with this like very simple logistical problem after these scientists just like solve this ridiculously technical problem. Oh, that's bizarre. Yeah, I, I had no idea that it was. That, you know, I know, I think there's only four states right now that are um, now giving the public the vaccinations while the rest of the states are still waiting. And then there's different priority levels of um, of who can get vaccinated. Um, I think Ben just got vaccinated. I don't know. I know yeah. we're not. I know we're I know me and my wife aren't. Um, we're in like level C or something, according to the chart that we received. Like we're not. We're not, we're like after like the medical frontline workers and, and, you know, nurses and people that are in uh, working in medical facilities and nursing facilities and stuff like that there. Um, so we've not been able to get, get it yet quite yet. So, um, but yeah, it's an interesting situation to see. There's, and then there's all these people that I have some friends that are like, no, I'm not going to get the vaccine, you know, and. <laughs> you know, hell no. Like, you know, and then, you know, I have other, the other friends of mine, they can't wait to get the vaccine. It's such a, yeah, it's such, there's some, such split opinions on, <clears> on the whole, on the whole matter. You, yeah. I really don't understand any vaxes. It's the craziest shit, but yeah, I was chatting, um, chatting to Ben yesterday about this. And he said, when he rocked up there, there was just like no organization. There was no like chain of command or anything. And the reason he got it is because he's like, uh, 
I don't know, he has like some certificate or something and when, you know, emergencies like this are required, like he's one of the people of a large amount of people who are educated or trained in such a way that they would call on to deal with these kind of things. And he hmm. asked them when he got the vaccine, he was like, you know, is there a way that I can just come in like on Sundays or something and organize the data or something like that just to keep shit a little bit more organized? And they just like, apparently the people there just didn't know who to talk to or even who to call to ask or anything. It's just apparently complete chaos. <laughs> that sounds about right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so like uh, your children, like what do they think of the studio? Do they, they spend much time in your studio? Oh, yeah. My son... And my daughter play down here often. And nice. uh, I'm actually built a little studio for my daughter. She's taking singing lessons and guitar lessons and uh, and a little bit of piano. We've got her a singing coach. She's She just loves singing. And I set up a, a little uh, studio. Well, we it's, I'd say studio. There was already gear up in this room. We call it <laughs> our music room. It's We call it the music rooms because it's got, I don't know, we've got probably... 3,000, 4,000 records in there. We've got like turntables and a PA system and it looks more like a record store than it does like a living room. Like people come over and they're like, whoa, this is not normal. And um, then we've got like a couple keyboards that I've set up for my daughter. She's got like like a a Moog little fatty and I've got like a, a, a Moog grandmother up there set up for her and she really likes the TR-8 s drum machine <laughs> and I've got like a mic pre set up with like a couple pedal effects and um, Novation Circuit that she really likes a lot. So she's been programming like little tracks on the circuit yeah. and um, then singing to them. <laughs> and um, so that's kind of like her little world up there that I've kind of made. And then we've got like a room, a room that's open to that, that's got just tons of instruments that I've collected all over the world. Um, everything from, you know, when I've been to like South Africa or like uh, Asia and South America, like on all my travels, I try to buy some unique instrument <laughs> um, or instruments if I can, as, as much as I can bring home with me on a plane or ship back. Um, yeah, that's a good uh, goal. I should probably do more of that. I saw a video on your Instagram of you recording like some uh, like whistle thing that you had. It was oh, like the yeah, the Aztec one. Death. Oh, the Aztec. Yeah. One. Yeah, I got that in Mexico or yeah, Mexico City when I was there. And yeah. Um, yeah, I've got probably 30 or 40 Aztec death whistles, all different kinds. And then I have different whistles where you fill them up with water and then they can sound like different birds and they mimic uh, different sort of animals. And yeah, really, really interesting. Um, yeah, I'm just, a, I don't know, I'm obsessed with collecting things that make r weird noises. <laughs> <laughs> in case anyone hasn't hasn't figured that out already but yeah i'm always uh um doesn't necessarily have to be a synthesizer i you know i'm i'm obsessed with anything that'll just create something interesting and different um and yeah so i always try to do that when i travel i always try to pick up something bring something home that i've not seen before i've not um like, so what's, you're you're in australia right is that where uh, you're based live, out of or? i live in san francisco but i am australian yeah Australian. Oh, okay. I didn't know where your home base was, but like last time I was in, when I toured in Australia, I, I, I bought like three didgeridoos and oh, nice. yeah, um, didgeridoos. Is bull, you, a couple bull roars. <laughs> can, can you play a didgeridoo? I can actually. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah, I got circular that. breathing down. Yeah. Circular breathing is tough. It's like you have to constantly be blowing out somehow whilst bringing new air in without like stopping the outward breath, which is... I, it's I tough. I bought a D <laughs> I bought a CD. D it was like a DVD CD that I bought that, that taught you how to circular breathe. And, um, I, I did it actually more started like beatboxing into the didgeridoo, like just not having to pull away, away from it. And then just kind of breathing while like doing repetitive like rhythms. And then I was able to do longer takes and then eventually do longer takes. And it took a little bit of practice, but it was, um, I was eventually able to get it, but yeah, it's super fun. I love the didgeridoo and, um, I just was like when me and my brother, when I, when I was there touring in Australia, I was like, oh, I've got to buy like a, like a, a real deal didgeridoo. I think when we were in Melbourne or Brisbane, I can't remember where it was, where, where we bought it, but I remember trying to get it home and at the airport, it's like huge thing made out of carved <laughs> eucalyptus wood and like super heavy, um, but yeah, there's the, it's like awesome. I remember buying a ton of stuff when I was there touring and 
I think I, yeah, I also did a, my devil fish modification to my 303 with Robin Riddle when I was in Melbourne. I, I brought my 303 to him personally and had him was like, here it is. Did please. he <laughs> used to write music under the name Robin Fox by any chance? Uh, I don't know. Um, Robin does make music. Is it like um, mostly sort of Max MSP and like AV stuff with lasers and stuff or? I'm not sure. He gets into a lot of strange stuff. The CDs that he give he gave me while I was there were all these binaural recordings he had done in the rainforest. Hmm. Um, so it was a lot of field recordings and um, really really interesting stuff. Um, but I mean, I don't know. He may have created these other things or have gone under. Yeah, the reason alias. I ask is because like years and years ago, I was uh, like on MySpace. Actually, um, I used to follow this guy called Robin Fox from Melbourne who. Uh, was just this crazy like max msp dude who would just yeah make all of these weird uh pieces of music that was supposed to be enjoyed with like a laser show but uh, okay cool the music was really just like bleeps and bloops and weird sound design it wasn't actually like i mean what you would consider traditional music it was more like sound design or something but i don't know sometimes those sound design things that are not necessarily uh you know very musical when you pair them with a visual experience that kind of ties it all together for your brain it can be a really cool experience anyway was the uh was any of the synthesis and stuff that he was doing in his compositions were they anyway like sort of synced with like jitter objects in max that were like were they tied to any visuals you were talking about lasers because i've been experimenting with lasers lately and audio controlling lasers so um just in my spare time just goofing around here but um Yo, yeah, I didn't know if he was experimenting with that or he had like somehow so synced. Yeah, I'm unsure. I mean, like I, he just had his music uploaded to MySpace and I guess at the time like video streaming was not a massive thing because the internet was still really slow. So um, he, I just, I just read it in like his bio that that was the goal of the music and that listening to it on MySpace really missed the point. But for some reason he had it <laughs> uploaded there anyway. Oh man, I miss the days of MySpace. There's some... That's some funny times. I haven't, I haven't looked at my MySpace page in probably four or five years, maybe more, maybe longer. I don't even know if it's, it's still the, around. It's the worst <laughs> platform now. Like I, I think I went there earlier this year in the, like during the pandemic sometime because I was like, oh, I'm bored and like I just remember MySpace. I'm like, I wonder what's going on there. And I, I went there and checked it out and it's just so dead and like the website is so broken and yeah, it's terrible. Oh, man. That's a bummer. I remember that's that that was like the place to hang out before. I think it was what Friendster before that. I'm trying to think of all these like. Well, the original socials. place to hang out, I think, was um, for musicians was like AOL or ICQ or Messenger. ICQ, or yeah. I remember being on ICQ, um, and there was um, oh, there was a server that we used to hang out on back in the day. It was like me and Christian Vogel, and like a bunch of crazy people, Sean from Autecker and Dogs on Acid or whatever. <laughs> No, it was a server that my friend Jeff used to run he, and he shut it down. It was like a BBS server that we used to all log on to and trade patches and stuff back in the day. And it was an awesome place. It was just like software developers and uh, experimental electronic artists from all over the world would log in. And we used to just congregate there and like have ch- like these long chat threads about just, you know, synthesis and different synthesis methods and sampling or just gear equipment, just production techniques and stuff. And this was back in like, I want to say like late nineties, early two thousands. And, um, back when we were just all on like the G three wall street MacBooks and stuff. (laughs) And, and, uh, yeah, those were cool days. Like those were, I miss those days of just like us having this like super cool underground spot just to like trade up on like, you know, patches and stuff like that. And there's something that's been um, lost, right? Like these days in the music, um, the electronic music, uh, space, which is, uh, exploration, I guess there's not as much of it as there once was, I think, because it's just, it's such well-trodden ground now that, um, yeah, I mean, obviously like you're constantly finding stuff and uploading it to your Instagram that I've never seen. Like for instance, that emission control thing that you were using at some point, I'd, I'd Oh, that, yeah, that's, that's Curtis Rhodes. Um, who's a professor at the UC Santa Barbara, and he's written several books, Microsound, which is a very famous book in the computer music tutorial, which is another famous book that a lot of universities like. It's like a holy grail, very thick book that defines a lot of the technical terms of digital synthesis, digital signal processing, and um, 
but Mike Rassan's probably his most famous book. You can, Curtis is like, to me, considered like the grandfather of grand, uh, granular synthesis. And um, if you don't have that book, I highly recommend checking it out. It completely will change your whole perspective on how you think about sound. What is it and, called? Microsound? Uh, mic microsound by Curtis Rhodes. Yep. Cool. And um, yeah, that book is incredible. It like, uh, and Curtis's music is absolutely incredible too. He, I'm a huge fan of. I've been using his apps and uh, been a fan of his music since the since the late '90s, and was using Pulsar Generator and a lot of his iOS apps, or not iOS. I'm sorry, Mac OS, OS X. Uh, before it was OS X, it was nine point OS nine point two. So I was using his stuff on o, OS nine point one, uh, OS nine point two. Um, there was Pulsar Generator, which was a granular based synthesis engine. And then um, there was a couple other apps. You could you could probably, uh, he, they might be still available on his website, but yeah, he's done some incredible stuff. And I had the honor of um, doing a, a concert with him and he featured me in his second book, uh, which was like rhythmic techniques and electronic music. And then he had me featured in a couple chapters, which I was completely on. I was like, oh my God, you're like the... <laughs> the pinnacle for me, um, you know, I'd studied his work for so many years and read all of his books and it, it was just an honor for him to reach out to me and said, Hey, um, I'd love to invite you to UC Santa Barbara to do a concert series. And, um, if you don't mind, you know, I'd love to also feature you in my book. And I was just completely blown away. That was, you know, I wasn't really wasn't expecting that to be honest. Um, but he's incredible. Um, and, uh, he really makes you think about time like he's he with emission control specifically that app so the app that you saw that had been ported to that was actually a super collider patch um that one of the students that worked with curtis or several i think it was two students that worked with curtis had, had designed that for curtis so emission control was basically uh, his idea but w um, was put together by by a few graduates and would only run, the original version of it would only run on a G5 Mac, which I still have. I actually still have a G5 Mac tower for that specific reason that was running that spe just, specific just build. Just to run a mission control? Just to run the super collider patch, yeah. Wow. Um, because how incredible it was. Um, like you could literally take a four second sample and create an entire 20 minute intricate piece of music with just four seconds of sound. And so if you think about that, you just like a micro universe, like when I was at Curtis's studio, he took a, just a, re a field recording of just like dried leaves being crushed, you know, like a high quality recording of dried leaves or just like these sticks, like small sticks being crushed, you know, and then he put that short sample into emission control and then just like let it go nuts. And I remember being in his studio being like, just blown away at the infinite complexity that he was able to get with just the most minimal amount of, of source material. And, you know, just the whole idea of like zooming into this, this macro universe uh, of sound, which is, you know, um, it, it just blew me away. The, the whole concept so why of not everything. Else. Rebuild this for a, like a newer system, you know, like Mac OS X or something. Well, he did. Um, they, these, these other people ported, um, took all that, took basically that super collider patch and, and updated it, uh, emission, which is what I posted on my Instagram channel. Mm. It was the emission control version two, uh, gotcha. which now runs on newer <laughs> updated OS systems. You don't need a G5 processor Mac. Like, um, you did to have to run the original one and you also don't need all of the super collider extension libraries and stuff to, to run it. Cause just to get all the components to run the original patch was, was a bit tricky. Um, and you also had to have super collider running, which is not a deal breaker because super collider is free. You can download it free now, but, um, to get it set up and running was a little bit of a, um, a little bit of a process, but the new version, you don't have to do any of that. They ported everything over. Everything's now encapsulated into the application itself. So you're able to run it natively without any, um, without the need of running super collider. And it's, uh, it's pretty awesome to see it make a comeback. So I was really excited, uh, when it did. And I wanted to, of course, let my fans know for them 
and be like, Hey, check this out. This is really cool. You know, (laughs) for those of you who may not be aware of it, um, you know, I try to be pretty transparent about cool things that I feel are really interesting or could be interesting to other people that might want to explore, you know, um, one sound technique or processing technique or, uh, or an idea or, you know, or, or an instrument, it could be an instrument focused, uh, thing, you know, I just, um, I'm always like looking for new things and playing with stuff and <laughs> constantly exploring. It never gets old to me, you know, I don't know. I guess I'm just obsessed with like finding new things that, um, that are fun to make music with or create new sounds with. And yeah, I noticed that you do a lot of this kind of stuff with, um, like you don't stop at just stuff you can do on hardware, like synthesizers or your computer. Like you also do a lot of stuff with like iPhone apps and stuff like that. Yeah. I love iOS stuff too. And there's so many great developers I worked with over the years in the iOS community. And, um, I think I was, I think I did like one of the first all music, compositions with tabletop um this old ios app from probably many people don't know it but it was one of the first full-fledged like daw inside an ios app where you could like connect up your own devices and make the sequences for all the groove boxes and stuff connect them all together and then like make a complete track out of it um by retronyms i don't know if you they the company retronyms um they're in, i think they're also based in san francisco and they've done collaborations with like Akai and I did a bunch of sound design with them for a lot of their apps and then later did work with with Akai on the IMPC Pro app and a bunch of other apps that they released um so it was uh it was a great entry to um working in the in the world of iOS and um I've continued to stay working in there and, and done a lot of sound design for other other developers that do really cool stuff and it's it's a great platform. I love it. I, I feel like the, the newer generation uh, of people making music, I, ha- I have friends that are like younger friends, they do everything on the I- the iPad. That's their music production studio. You know, they're doing everything through that. And I've even messed around with it. Like my favorite app right now is Drambo. I love that. What's it called? It's Drambo. Drambo. I'll have to check oh, it out. Oh, yeah. You, you in- instant buy <laughs> on the App Store. App. It's like a modular sequencing um, environment. Uh. You have different modules and stuff. It sounds great. The interface is really interesting. Um, You can create really, really interesting compositions with it. And uh, it's definitely one of my favorites as far as if you just, you want to flesh out an entire track or if you want to just do some cool sketches, it's definitely one of my my recent favorites. I think I, I made a post on my instagram as well i did a little track demo post of it yeah i found I, some other cool stuff on your instagram like uh sequence that was a cool one. Oh yeah sequence yeah it's that's like a fun one weird little sperm like creatures organisms with, yeah you know, with these like <laughs> nodes on their head exactly yeah and you make sort of the, it's, it's all based on like a gestural sort of movements that drive the the notational paths of the different notes and and things that happen and yeah i love stuff like that just sort of out of the box thinking of you know music gestural um you know kind of paint painting with 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 numbers or um it's it's really really fun yeah i'm I'm, like i said yeah there's so many cool apps then there's so many apps that um that have also kind of i I kind of wish they kept there at least a handful like I have like 40 or 50 apps where the developers just didn't keep keep updating up with the latest OS and they've they've just they're not natively running on the on like iOS 13 or iOS 14 right now it's kind of a bummer cuz some of the more underground stuff was really cool but yeah I try to keep up with a lot of that stuff too cuz sometimes you know like I can't be in the studio I'm with the kids and you know we're upstairs or something and the most convenient thing to have to play with is an iPad with headphones when kids are watching their TV shows or whatnot, I'm sitting on the couch. Um, sometimes it's just fun to pull up a uh, me rack and m- plug up a couple modules like VCV rack stuff and, and, or, you know, use Drambo or use some, some other iOS app, um, borderlands, or there's so many fun ones, um, that, you know, that are fun to play around with or do little sketches with it. Just, it's, there's, there's so much out there. Um, but yeah, yeah, you're right. I, I try to, yeah, try not to leave, 
I, I try not to always be focused just on one thing. I know a lot of people are probably like, oh, he's just the modular guy or whatever. But, um, you know, I, I try to always keep things, um, at least on my social media channels, kind of always different and not uh, not trying to keep it always focused on just one thing. Like try to vary it up quite a bit from, you know, week to week. There could be something completely different or random, you know, um, to check out. And, uh, and in between that, there's like little snippets of music tracks I'm working on at that given point in time, you know, could be just some random patch or whatever, you know, it's really just kind of, I, I don't really put that much thought into it. It's not like a curated thing. You know, I don't have like a, a YouTube channel, like all these other YouTube stars where they like curate all these different topics and stuff. It's, that's really not me. I just, it's just purely whatever I'm messing with at that point in time and yeah it seems like really it's, what it <laughs> yeah exactly it just seems like you explore with all sorts of like random tools that you find on the internet or that get given to you or that you just hear about and whatnot and then just make weird stuff with them and then go oh that's it cool and just upload it which is really fun that's... i mean i love looking at your social media for that reason both because like i find out about a lot of tools that i wouldn't have heard of otherwise and because you also use a lot of tools that I do know about in really um, like just ways that I wouldn't think to use them, which is always fun. Um, oh, that's awesome. Speaking I'm of glad it's helpful. Modular, <laughs> yeah, it's really helpful. Speaking of modular stuff, when was the last time that you bought a module? Uh, today. Oh, shit. <laughs> nice. I was under the impression that you would have just gotten given all of your modules because of your Instagram at this point. It's like kind of like the John McAfee pump and dump schemes for Bitcoin or whatever, but it's like well, the Richard Divine modular scheme. You give you a module, you like make a post about it, and then they sell like a million copies. <laughs> well, no, I do help out. I try to help out new uh, modular manufacturers. If there's somebody doing something that's really interesting that I feel that's really cool. And a lot of these people are one-man shows. You know, They're doing all the development on their own. They don't have a lot of money. Um, so a lot of times they'll send me a prototype. They may not send me a final version of the module, which is fine. So what they'll do is it's like, Hey, would you, um, maybe get the word out? I don't have the reach that you have, you know, to get the word out to all these people, this module I've been working on for like four or five years or this synth that I've been working. I've had these, this company, um, I think they're in Poland who just made the vector synth they sent me. And, um, you know, it's just two guys in a basement. They, you know, they're just getting stuff going. They really don't have a huge budget to do a lot of advertising and stuff like that. So a lot of these companies just reach out because um, they know that the people that are following my feed are the exact people that would probably be interested in what they're designing. So, um, and I turn on a lot of people away. There's a lot of companies that have hit me up where I'm like, you know what, that's really cool. But that the people that follow my channel would probably not be interested in this product. You know, like the, there's a very, like I've tried to make my channel very, it's like a very niche channel that's specifically aimed towards like kind of boutique instruments, modules, or synthesizers um, that are more specific to kind of like sound design. You know, if you're more interested in get deeper into like synthesis or sound, it's, it's more, it's, it's definitely geekier, a more nerdier rabbit hole of going down into, which, you know, um, I've really tried to keep it just focused in that area and not really kind of make it like this free for all kind of channel where I'll like cover any, you know, just anything that comes out that's popular or, you know, or some popular topic or something. I don't cover political or, you know what I mean? It's just strictly stays the same. It's just cool, weird, interesting things that I find. And that's always pretty much how I try to keep it being. And, and I try to keep that also with the Eurorack modular community, you know, so um, I get hit up by a lot of Eurorack modular manufacturers but i don't um necessarily post up everything that you know or i kindly just say i don't know i don't think that the people who follow me will be too interested in this it's got to be really something different that's kind of you know really thinking out of the box at this point for me to want to be posting it on my channel so um yeah no but yeah i, I buy stuff all the time still um I, I buy a lot of stuff for research for my own uh, for you know, making samples and making new sounds and just, um, I know probably people all think that I've connected with every company, but there's tons of companies that I don't know. And I actually like supporting people that are just starting out. I always offer to buy this stuff up first. Usually they end up giving it to me, but I'm like, Hey, no, I, I actually want to buy this. I want to support you. I think you're doing something cool because if, 
if you don't make money from doing this, then how else are you going to keep producing cool stuff? And then if you don't make cool stuff, then how can I make cool stuff? That's how I look <laughs> at it, you know? Mm, and that's a great way to look I, at it. And, you know, when it comes to like people making really cool plugins, I always just, if it's like an, a really cool plugin that I like, I'm like, wow, this is a fascinating concept. Like I instantly buy it and get in, not only do I get buy it, I buy it first, but then I get in contact with the, with the people and tell them like, look, I bought your stuff and I just wanted to tell you how amazing this product is or how cool it is. And that you're doing something really unique that I feel is, um, vastly different than what everyone else is doing. Um, and you know, um, I, and I'd like to support those people that, that are actively trying to make a difference and do something completely, you know, different, not go with the, you know, the mainstream, you know, just try to, you know, I feel like these days, as you said earlier in the conversation, you know, a lot of people are not exploring as much. I feel like people are really playing it safe these days, you know, and playing it safe musically as well. Like they'll just, you know, go for the popular EDM styles or whatever the current, you know, trend is. And, um, I've never been interested in that. I've always been interested in more, you know, exploring. <laughs> yeah, it's really uh, sort of awesome. Uncharted you, territory. Yeah, it's awesome that you made that work because I feel like a lot of people who are in that explorative territory just don't, you know. And I think that's why so many people make the EDM stuff because they see how many people have made careers out of that side of things, I guess. And they're like, well, you know, um, there's a higher like reward for doing a good job in EDM, whereas like doing a good job in the experimental world, it's like it's hard to say if that equals a career, you know. <laughs> um, oh, it's true. Yeah, I mean, I'm not gonna lie. I'm not gonna say that. Yeah, it's been easy or anything. Um, but because I've been so, I've, I've, you know, just strategically been like, you know what, I'm gonna focus my skills in in completely different worlds, and you know, try to push the world of sound design as far as I can in any direction Then I'm, you know, whether, whatever the context is, you know, and that's, I think that's why I've been able to work with so many different um, technologies and companies is because I've been this person who's not been scared to jump into these things too. Cause sometimes people get intimidated by this stuff and, and it's easy to, you know, people get into their comfort zones. They get, you know, comfortable with what they like using to make music. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's, you know, I tell people like you should you should make music with what you feel comfortable with and you feel confident with that you could express yourself with these tools. You know, you shouldn't sit down and get frustrated with some, some instrument or some environment. And, you know, you're not going to make your best music with something that constantly is nerve wracking and you feel limited with, or, you know, you, you know, you can't feel you can get in, into a creative space with. So um, for me, I, I, I like to switch things up all the time because I feel like, I constantly want to break out of my old habits and be like, okay, I need to just not make music on a computer today or, um, or maybe I'll just make a track on the computer or do live coding or do something where I'm working with max MSP or a reactor patch or something, or working with some virtual synth I've never played with before. Um, or one day it could be just like, I'm going to just make music on this drum machine or this synth or, you know, like I just constantly love having the ability to jump around to different things and not be too, not feel like I'm like constrained to working in one environment or having to create sounds in one environment. Um, and it's, I think a lot of it is just my weird brain. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Um, I, I feel like I'm um, going back to people using tools that they're just like in their comfort zone with, um, you know, quite a lot of, a lot of the time, I think if your goal is to just like get a piece of music finished, um, more often than not, it's probably useful to go for the thing that you're comfortable with and know your way around than like being in that exploratory world where you're trying to like learn a new thing and whatnot. Like for instance, I just got given the Zoya Euroburo by Empress. Um, and you know, if I jump on that thing, there's no way a piece of music happening. It's like, I'm, that's a deep box. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm sitting there like, you know, pressing these little squares, making these connections and doing all sorts of whatever. Like I'm definitely not making music at that point. Yeah. I've had, the Zoya is a great, that's a great pedal. They're going to migrate, they're migrating it over to a Eurorack module. Oh, that's what I was right now. talking about. Yeah. The Euro Bureau. Oh, you have the, you have the module now or do you yeah, have the pedal? Yeah. No, I've, I've got both actually. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. I just have the pedal. Um, and the pedal was really cool. I made a couple patches, um, in it. And, uh, I, I'm a huge fan of all the Empress stuff. I use like their reverb and, um, 
was just love their stuff. But yeah, I need to check out the Eurorack module. I have yet to, I don't know how different it is from the pedal. I would imagine that it's pretty similar just with CV input control and yeah, exactly. And, um, and, but yeah, I need to, that's one I need to, one to check out on my list. Um, but yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah. You could get lost in, in any one of these devices and spend, you know, weeks upon days of just like trying to figure out how to use stuff without being really productive in the studio, you know? And like, like you said, and when I tell people, you know, whatever you feel most comfortable with making music with is what you should use and you know, what you're most productive with too, you know? And also it's what your goals are too. I think that's important. It's like, what, what do you want to achieve with this stuff? I have friends that they don't want to make music. They just want to fiddle with stuff and, and, um, and it's just, it's kind of like the whole, like, Hey, I just want to sit on my back porch and play guitar. I don't want to do anything else. It's just more like medicine for me. It's like, it's not necessarily about having to make a song or be, being stressed out about making a, you know, making a track out of all this stuff. It's purely medicine for me just to sit here and, you know, it's like someone going skateboarding or going, you know, kayaking, or it's like any other activity that, that sort of just it's like a therapeutic experience where you just get something out of it. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to accomplish anything or do anything. You just do it and it just makes you feel nice. And (laughs) yeah, I mean, some people are rewarded, I think in different ways too, you know, like some people mm -hmm. can go through a whole career with music, doing the same thing, their entire career and be fine with that. Totally. But like other people, um, I think like I'm sort of, you know, I need a balance of those days where I, I'm not trying to write music and instead trying to like entertain myself with new interesting ways of making music, but not necessarily getting music written. Right. And it's like, you need to, after you do this for 10 plus years, like keep yourself engaged with it. You know, so you're not just on autopilot going through the motions, making the same shit all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's why I like to switch, switch things up. Um, you know, it's to get out of that autopilot sort of mentality where, you know, I like kind of like pulling the carpet out from my feet sometimes being like, Oh, what if I had to do everything with just this or this environment? DAW or something like that. Yeah. Completely like I'll use Bitwig today or I'll use max for live for this or logic or Cubase. You know, I'm, I've used so many different things that, you know, and I don't have like, I'm, I don't have a preference either way. It's like, I just, you know, just wherever my brain's wandering that day to want to explore something. And, you know, I, ch- I think that's why I've stayed in it so long too. You know, I think, you know, what I feel like I'm like the old dad now, but, <laughs> but it's, it's, yeah, it's just this constant, constant search for like something new, something that's kind of like, wow, it's like coming across some new thing you've never heard before. I've always I'm always kind of interested in like trying to find the sound I've never heard before or like this combination of things that create this space I've never heard before this unusual, um, you know, trying to create something that you can't really describe even what it is. That's, that's really like the ultimate goal for me. Um, So I'd imagine you're the kind of person that, um, like doesn't get hit with writer's block, right? Oh no, there's days. Yeah. There's definitely days where, um, I feel like, you know, your, your brain's just completely like smash and working all day or dealing with like family stuff. And, you know, you're not feeling very creative and you feel like you want to be productive and creative and, um, and yeah, sometimes, sometimes the best thing to do, or for me, is just to go for a walk. Go. <laughs> we, we live in, uh, the woods, um, and, and like in my backyard, I can just walk in the woods and you know, there's lots of nature. We've got two big creeks and lots of trees, like 40, 30 acres of land behind us. It's all floodplains. And yeah, so I can just go for a walk. And sometimes the best thing to do is just walk away from something. If you had your head too deep in it and, um, just come back with a fresh kind of mind, you know, I, I, it's least works for me. I know that might not work for everyone's, um, when it comes to writer's block, but a lot of times I just have to leave it and come back to it with a different frame of mind or like listen to something that's completely opposite of what I'm working on to get my head out of it for a few minutes or for, you know, uh, or longer, and then kind of come back to it with a new perspective and see if I can like work on it and make a better, make it better. Or sometimes I make it worse. (laughs) Well, the reason I ask is because, um, 
Like I hear this idea espoused so often in the electronic music community where people are like, oh man, music was like so fun at first. And I was like, you know, I was getting into that flow state for 12 hours every night and going to bed at 5 a.m. and losing track of time and you're making a bunch of music. And now that I'm like better at producing, it's all kind of like boring. I wish I had like the skills that I had now, but with the flow state and like uh, and you know excitement that I had about it then. And I think a big part of that is... um uh that they that they lose that explorative property right because it's like at the start you didn't really know what anything in say ableton was so the entire process was explorative and that's really fun and inspiring and it makes you want to keep going back to that thing to be like what else is there you know like you want to come back the next day and be like what else can i find you know it's like it's you're like a kid in a playing hide and seek or something it's like exciting and um and i feel like yeah uh that's why i was like maybe you don't get that feeling as much as other people because you're constantly in this world of just like exploring. Exploring. Things. Yeah. That's, that's probably, uh, you know, it's a big, that's big, a big part of it. Yeah. Um, but definitely there's been times I'm not going to lie. I'm just like anybody else. You know, I've run into situations when I've been working on my own music where I've been banging at this track for months and, you know, I'm at a point where I'm like, I don't know where to go with this or, you know, at some point, like, where does it go from here i've like already spent weeks and weeks <laughs> trying to figure out where this track is gonna head and and banging my head on it over and over and over but yeah the, yeah like i like like you said yeah it's i, I constantly like exploring new things it, it it's that like you said it's like that that new something new what can i do with this new thing if you can kind of keep that um you know, that, that state of frame of mind, uh, for me, at least that's what I like doing for myself is, you know, constantly exploring new stuff. And, you know, sometimes you get great stuff. Sometimes you don't get so, such great stuff, but, um, there's always something different that happens that you wouldn't normally do. And I'm always interested in the stuff that I wouldn't typically normally do. Um, and these accidental things, I love the spot, like the spontaneity of something like accidentally going wrong or not hooking up something the right way. Cause you don't, completely understand what you're doing and then something happens and like whoa this is this is really interesting and especially with modular stuff that's what i love about i love watching other people coming to patch on my system um because they'll do things differently than i will do and then i'll be like what did you just do there that uh, i wouldn't have thought to do that. i've never thought to use these modules in this <laughs> sort of combination and and the way that you're using i would have never thought to do that and that's what i love about systems that are so open-ended like that there's no there's no rules there's no right or wrong way to do things and um i love that i love any instrument where there's not a wrong way to play it you know you can't you can't fuck it up it's just do go with whatever emotionally you connect with and it's getting something interesting to you at that moment in time you know i think that's an inspiring instrument um you know you just go with your intuition and you figure out your flow with it and um with a bit of time something will happen you know if you spend enough time with it so it's uh yeah i don't know how to it's hard to describe that it kind of just something that i try to do all the time here every night <laughs> yeah that's awesome <laughs> So you patch every single night? <laughs> Pretty much. Um, I think yeah, I've said this in interviews before. I, like um, since 2016, I was, since I set up all these big, the, my big modular systems here and I have multiple systems all over the floor that I'm constantly changing out and stuff that, you know, I've got probably like four or five patches um, happening all at the same time. So they're all different ideas, you know, but you might see a video where I post a, a, a patch up, but people will see all these crazy wires and stuff. It's like, man, he's like got all this crazy shit, but we're only hearing like eight sounds. And <laughs> that's because you're only hearing eight sounds. Cause you're only hearing one small patch mm. amongst, you know, five or six other patches that are running, but all those other patches are muted because those are start. Those are other things that I'm working on, but I'm, I've either not finished them or I've got them to a point where I want to like take a break from them and then revisit them back. Um, and then finish them out into something, or I might record them out into a track that night. So, um, that's, what's, that's sort of been like my system over the last three or four years is like, okay, because you can't save the, you can't save a patch. Right. Um, it's, uh, so I just leave them <laughs> for weeks and then I kind of work on them and then I'll record them and then I'll pull the patch or I'll pull the section of that patch in the system and then I'll repatch something new while the other patches stay 
uh, in the same place until I can record them or get them to a point to where I feel like they're at a more interesting place. And then, um, so I do them in different stages. I'll do, I'll do different takes and versions of recorded recordings of those patches. So that's kind of how I've been working. And, um, so that's why everything's always like looks constantly crazy (laughs) in a lot of my modular videos. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's just my weird, method of madness i guess of of my way of working you know without um having to pull the patch because that was like the most kind of nerve-wracking thing was like i'd get something really good and then i was like okay where am i going to take it from here and then i would record it and i'll be like well i i need to spend some more time with it but then because i had such a small system i was like well i can't i have to record this and then (laughs) before i do anything else or i can't do anything else i was like well if i just build bigger systems and then link them together then i could create parts and then i started developing this other technique where i would mix different patches together and it's kind of how i did my sort lave album i was like i started like one patch on one system and then i would patch on another system and it would kind of have some relation to that other patch because they were sharing the same clock and then it would be different progressions of the the song would change it would like start at one point but then it would end up at this completely different point because it was all being played by four or five different systems connected together but they would all play their part and then come in at it's different times during the piece and then you would end up with these sort of organic changes that would happen over time that was like the only way that i could think about doing these changes that sounded interesting but didn't bore the listener i guess or bore me it was more my <laughs> my um uh you know my, my attention span as far as like how i wanted to drive the listener through a space you know t- trying to sort of like trying to tell a story with these instruments uh, or a patch that i had set up so um that was the way that i did it because the most difficult thing to do with the modular is to is to do drastic changes on the fly, like have one setting, then go to a whole different set of sounds and things without using samplers. Cause in uh, that record, I did everything with synthesis. I didn't use a single sampler to create that album. Like Even every like kick drum, every snare drum. or something like that. Nope. I didn't use any morphogenes or anything like that. That was all like synthesized. Um, I don't even know how so to like describe nothing, it. Nothing with a buffer. No, no buffered stuff. Wow, crazy! Like so, yeah. Is two HP freeze got a buffer in it, or plonk? Like is plonk a sampler? Maybe not. Plonk's a um, is oh, basically chromophone. Oh, it's yeah, like it's physical modeling, carpless strong mm-hmm. or whatever. Yeah, yeah. It's a physical modeling. Yeah, I used I used a lot of plonk. I used a lot of noise engineering stuff. Um, Damn, there was it's a lot really of impressive like to do that on modular with no no buffers. Yeah, it's a challenge. Definitely. Yeah. But it sounds different. Like if, when you listen to the record, it sounds really, really organic. And that was like, my intention was to, you know, to really make everything from scratch, make every hi-hat, every snare, you know, like everything just feel really, really organic. Like the sounds, like I was using resonators and all kinds of weird, like, yeah, I don't know how to like feedback resonators to create the melodies and um, and I'm working on a new album right now where I'm doing a, a, a similar thing where it's it's all like synthesis based stuff and you know creating melodies out of like feedback resonators and just weird things non non typical type stuff that um that I, ha- I haven't been hearing it anywhere else um, but yeah it's it's just yeah constant exploration and trying to push myself into new directions and and doing new things and. Um, yeah, but like I said, that's that's not necessary. I wouldn't say that's like I wouldn't. I don't want people to think like, "Hey, that's the way you should do things," because oh, <laughs> it's a real pain. It's a real pain in the ass, to be honest with you. It's not. Really it's not expensive, a fun. Expensive, right? Yes, expensive. Like building, very labor intensive. Yeah, exactly. Like you're saying, to basically make one song go through like five different sections, you essentially need five like giant. First of all, you need like enough modules to make like a part of a song which in the first place i mean to get a sing, sing, a single signal chain going in modular world is like three thousand dollars right there so like to make it's one crazy. Whole part of a song and then on top of that you need five of those whole setups yeah. to like go through a whole song and then on top of that if you're making an album you can't and you're trying to keep it like all organic and stuff then you can't just record it straight in you're going to need like outboard compressors and eqs to process it on the way in and 
Exactly. Yeah, that adds yeah, up real quick. It's doing... gonna be like hundreds of thousands of dollars a gear. It's yeah, it's ridiculous. Like to be honest with you, I mean, there's probably easier ways of doing this, a lot cheaper ways of doing this, and you know, there's and people have done it. People have, you know, I look at, you know, I look at like Rob and Sean Autecker. They've done all their stuff in the computer on on Max MSP, and it sounds incredible, you know, and. They didn't have to spend any money. They probably haven't bought any gear in years, which is awesome, you know? Um, and so that there's definitely no right or wrong way to do it. You know, I, I, like I said, I, I just want, it was more of a, a challenge that I put on myself. <laughs> I, I wanted to put myself through the hell of, of, of just seeing if it could be done. If I could make a record just with my hands, not use a timeline, not use a computer, or I, I mean, I used the computer, but it was more of a tape recorder. It just captured everything at the end of the day. You know, I didn't, I wanted everything to be mixed and created by hand and like everything feel more natural. Like I changed the progressions and made the things happen when I wanted them to happen. I didn't do it on a timeline with automation and stuff like that. So once like you how it once you recorded okay. stuff into the DAW, like you just didn't touch it, you just rendered it out from there. I know I did mastering and stuff to it. Yeah, I would take all the stems. I have a system here that can take 32 uh, of the modular stems and separate them. And then I can <clears throat> put them into my, um, I guess, my mastering. I have a, two summing mixers by Dangerous Music. And so I'd stem out all the. You know, then run them through my favorite like outboard EQ, analog EQs and compressors and stuff like that. And um, like, you know, Pultex and API. And I have a bunch of other stuff here that, you know, have different flavors of stuff that I like to, you know, I have like stuff for my drum bus and stuff like that. And that was another thing too, like the recording of the record too. I was like, you know what? I don't want to use plugins. I want to do everything with the hardware. And like you said, it was really expensive, but I was like, I want to learn how to use this stuff. Um, as weird as my music sounds, I want to find that perfect mixture of like, find my sound with this, with this gear that I've got. Like, what is that? Like, I want to find what that is. And like, the only way to do that is to just use this stuff and like, put it to work. Like, you know, night after night, like mix tracks, mix different stems through it, like find the different combinations that work for you and what, you know, you'll quickly see the strengths and weaknesses of like the, the equipment. Um, and how it will work for your sound, you know, like everybody sounds different, but, um, it was, it was more of like a learning exercise. I wanted to learn a lot. I'm always one of these people that's like always up for the, for the challenge just to learn things, you know? Um, cause otherwise I, I don't think I would, I'd probably be, uh, you know, I probably wouldn't learn anything if I didn't say, Hey, I'm going to do it this way and just stick to my guns. And, you know, if anything, I'm going to at least learn how to use this stuff and be able to make better stuff the next round that I use this stuff again on my next record or my next release or whatever I do down the road. So yeah, if you're not I don't look at it yourself on albums and stuff like that. And yeah, you, you're just like staying in your own little world and just like not, yeah, not like flexing <laughs> at all. It's <laughs> like, it's really hard to get anywhere. It's really hard to progress in any sort of way that at least I find interesting for myself as well. Yeah, yeah. Like I, like I said, I'm. Um, you're right. I'm totally in my own little world. I really am. I'm definitely living in, in, uh, you know, in a, in my own space, working on my own time. I'm not like, you know, um, you know. I, I think about just the stuff that I did in 2021. I just released like an acid record. I hadn't made acid record in 20 years. I don't know why, what compelled me to want to make acid music, but I was like, I want to release an acid record. I know no one's making acid music. Probably no one cares about acid music anymore, but. Oh, G. Jones is doing a lot of acid these days. And Oh yeah. Greg, he's, Greg's really super cool, man. Yeah. He, uh, yeah. He's a big he fan of out. yours as well, I think. And yeah, he did. He reached out to me about the uh, record. He actually bought the vinyl, uh, the cystic record and reached out to me over uh, uh, on Instagram and on Twitter and said, he's super cool. Really nice guy. He made his tracks are awesome. I, I found out about Greg's music through, um, Sander Eprom. Eprom nice. showed me his yeah. stuff. And he's great as well. I really like Eprom's work. Yeah. Too. Oh yeah. Sanders is great, man. His, he's a amazing producer and Greg is too. The, both of those guys. I mean, I, I really respect what they do. They're doing really, really cool, cool music. I would say like, if you're looking in like the bass bass music community, like I think they're some of the most forward thinking, you know, maybe like I like really like Little Snake, like what Gino's doing. He's doing really cool stuff. Jimmy Egger's doing great stuff. Like these are some of my friends that 
that are taking like that sound and really pushing it into new directions, you know? Um, yeah, I agree. I, I think I'll, I'll, what um, Greg and Sandra are doing is they're taking like, they're basically doing what you can get away with in bass music. Like they're taking that to its limit. Like they're taking it just, just before the point at where I think like a lot of these bass music people would be like, no, that's like too challenging for me. Yeah. And that's what I love about what they're doing, you know, especially Gino. Gino's really like, twisting shit out there really really getting crazy with it like um just yeah i love all his like uh actually we were we're working on a track together um we're doing a little collaboration track that's pretty cool it's like this really abstract electroacoustic bass track all that goes all over the place and um but yeah i love that i love that they're trying to push it and really like do something different outside of the norm but still kind of like like you said like you could still dance to it you could still hear it at in a like in a festival environment but it would be it's kind of like a little bit thinking outside the box a bit you know with the textures and some of the sound design and like um even some of the stuff that happens in the track the compositional decision making that's happening i love some of that stuff that they're doing is really cool and um, you know i just think it's really definitely- impressive that like with greg's music it's sort of like, um, and I hate to sort of use this term, but for lack of a better word, like the lowest common denominators like in the scene, right? Like people who just like don't know a lot about electronic music and who generally like pretty non-challenging, consonant, like easy to listen to electronic music. Those people can not like enjoy it and, and love it. And then people like you and I uh, who are like more on the technical end of stuff can still listen to it and like tell that it's really intelligent. And I think to be able to like hit both of those demographics like like that is just so hard to do. And Greg has done it massively in a great way. So is like Flume, for instance, you know, like Flume is one of those producers where I'm, I mean, he's fucking massive, you know, like people who listen to pop music just love his stuff. And then also somebody like me who's, you know, right on the technical end of synthesis and whatnot is also like, wow, that's like actually really intelligent and well done. Yeah, his stuff is great, too like yeah i i think you're absolutely right they ride that fine line and i think that's what makes their stuff so unique to people like us that could recognize the the um the interesting uniqueness that they add to their productions that kind of set them aside from other the other producers that are in that realm and yeah flumes i think yeah um i think he's messaged me on instagram nice once or twice awesome. but just randomly i i, I think he's i, I might have um, there's so many random people that have messaged me that have like blown my mind on Instagram. I'm <laughs> like, whoa, like, uh, um, Pete Townsend from the who messaged me one night. Oh, on wow. there. <laughs> and then like, I mean the most like people I didn't even know who, like, I don't even know who they are. So I don't, I'll look like click their profile and be like, Oh wow, that's so-and-so or, um, or this person or Richie Houghton or dead mouse or like the craziest people like, uh, have like reached out to me over Instagram and I'm like, whoa, I didn't even know they were following me or, you know, I'm just, <laughs> I have no clue. I'm kind of like you said, I'm just in my own world and, and, uh, just keep doing my thing. But it's, it's crazy. It's crazy how the technology now can link you with all these people you may not have been, been connected with before, or, you know, like, cause I've been making music for, for a long time. And <laughs> the way I, when I grew up, it was, it was, we didn't have this this infrastructure that we have set up to just be able to like message someone from all the way around the world and be like direct dm them you know that second's like hey you're doing something pretty crazy you know um it's just mind blowing yeah i feel like it's 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 an interesting time now to make music and be a musician within this current state of affairs whatever you want to call it yeah but definitely. um I'd love to um, switch the conversation a bit to um, like follow that line a bit uh, and talk about tech a little bit because I know that you're now working at Apple um, and you've worked at like Google before and you've worked at Jaguar and like you've done a bunch of sort of work in these techie industries. Um, Mm -hmm. What Yeah, what can you say about like your work at Apple? I know like probably there's a bunch of red tape around talking about a lot of it. and But like, I mean, <laughs> you could probably speak about maybe what your job is there and like what sort of your day-to-day consists of. And just, yeah, I'm really interested in like what kind of a, a job Apple would have for somebody like you. Um, well, my official title there is a senior content producer for music audio apps. Um, 
so it's uh yeah it's just basically content creation content creation for them um i've been a i've been a logic user for oh man since the beginning since it was an e-magic product and um yeah i mean it's not really much to say other than yeah i just do content creation for them um and that's what i've been currently doing now i guess for seven months i'm still pretty new but i was at google for like four years and i was doing totally different stuff i was there at google i was working as a user interaction sound designer so i was doing like sound design for a lot of their um their apps on the mobile phones like the pixel and the android line and then it was uh then a lot of like we started getting into ambisonic stuff. So I did a lot of 3d audio, spatialized audio mixing and recording, um, for them for Google earth VR. I don't know if you got a chance to play with that on, if you have a VR headset. I do, but um, yeah, I haven't played with that yet, but yeah, I did all the ambisonic, uh, mixing and user interface sound design stuff for that, uh, environment. And then we worked on several different, um, virtual reality, apps where I did all the spatialized mixing and stuff. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, I, I'm all over the place. Like you said, with Jaguar, like we did, I worked on several cars for them that were prototypes. And then the I pace, the electric vehicle, that was a whole completely different. Um, I don't even know how to describe that. That's such a weird job. <laughs> Maybe yeah. the weirdest, probably the weirdest sound design job I've ever had was yeah, working we should, on. We should definitely break this down and explain it because people are not going to know what this job was. But from what I understand, uh, Jaguar made an electric car. Uh, there's a law in the US or maybe elsewhere as well that like- In the car, UK. Hmm. In the UK, that, that a car has to make a certain amount of noise for it to be legally allowed to drive on the road so pedestrians can hear it. So to fix this problem of the car being too quiet because it was electric and didn't have an engine, they basically put speakers on the outside of the car and then you generated some sort of generative system to generate car noise depending on like the user input from the accelerator and all sorts of stuff to, to play sound. So it was legally able to be driven on roads. That's pretty, that's pretty much it. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, they, uh, the legislative law in the UK, um, I think it was passed in 2011 or 2012, I believe. And that law was passed because of, there were a bunch of lawsuits that had happened. There were that, um, that had happened to other electric car manufacturers that were coming out at that time because they were all silent and particularly people that can't see that are blind were, were a big number of those lawsuits that, that it were kind of forced. So they had to figure out something quickly. That's why the legislative law got passed very quickly. And then going forward, because Jaguar is based in the United Kingdom, um, they had to really think about what they were going to do because they knew that eventually at some point they're going to transition most of their vehicles over to, to at the stage that I came into, they were, they were at the hybrid stage. So there was like, combustion based half ba electric based vehicles but eventually everything's going to move over to all electric based battery run vehicles so it was a problem that they knew that wasn't going away and so one of the technical specialists there um my friend ian very cool guy he actually was a fan of my music <laughs> for many many years before he worked at jaguar uh, he went to my i think he went to one of my shows when i played in birmingham england or was either there or newcastle i can't remember where it was in the uk whenever i was on tour back in the warp days and he just reached out to me <laughs> on twitter randomly one day he was like hey this this is going to sound like a really strange unusual proposition but you can say no if this is something you don't think you might be able to tackle but we're working on a electric vehicle and we're wondering if you'd be interested in collaborating with us and designing sounds for this car. Um, and I said, wow, that sounds completely out of this world. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'd love to join and I'd love to, tr to try this out and just see what happens. Um, and yeah, it was in a, it was a long process. It, I'd worked with them for about four or five years and we worked on several prototype cars before we, launched the I, the iPace vehicle, which was the actual car that um, became the finished product. But the first car I worked on with them was the CRX-75, which I think there's only five of them in the world. 
because they were going to go into production, but they decided to stop because um, it was a it was close to a million dollars that this car was going to sell for. I think it was like nine hundred and eighty thousand pounds. Is what it was. What is it was initially going to sell for? It's um, crazy. And so, yeah. So it was Jaguar's seventy fifth anniversary, uh, celebrating seventy five years of heritage of. Uh, uh, Jaguar, so this was going to be their anniversary vehicle. So what it was was a, it was a uh, it was a hybrid. It was a you know a half combustion based, half electric based vehicle. That was the first car that they hired me to work on designing sounds for. Um, and you can look up videos on YouTube and stuff of it. There's some there is some press material about it. the car. Looks really cool, by the way. It's really neat looking. Um, and the tough part about that was the EV engines at the time sounded like a scooter, like a really whiny scooter. <laughs> it did not match aesthetically to the look of that car when they did the initial test before we put the speakers in and made it sound much more like a race car or like a, they want their, their brief their that they had sent me as they wanted it to sound like the space pod racers in star Wars or like the Tron light cycles, you know, something really futuristic, electrical sounding. And, um, that was a real challenge first to try to work to the speaker specifications because we had these really strange speakers that we that had very a very limited frequency response there wasn't much bass at all they projected really far and they were really loud but they had a very limited range of like what's what frequencies they could output so it was a it was this real it was really challenging to get all just all of the parts working just right to make it believable. Like it was like, first is this like believable that it's coming from this car. And then we also have to think about the aesthetics of the actual EV tone. Like, you know, like as the driver hits the pedal and accelerates, it has to, the sound has to mimic the car, like accelerating and speeding up or slowing down those, those things like, all of these physical things that you have to account for and then figure out how to design a system that can take all that data and, you know, apply that in a real world situation. <laughs> it was an extremely challenging uh, job. And since I'd worked so much with video games, like my first, uh, um, I, I'm trying to think of like, all the research I'd done was, was to look at different systems of how we built games. Like I worked on the Forza racing game, uh, worked on a bunch of stuff with the Epic and Bungie, like Halo Wars, um, Gears of War. I worked on doing sound design. I was on the sound design team for a lot of the earlier, uh, game and some of their, uh, when I was working with AKQA, um, uh, which is a big design from actually on the Bay area. I did a lot of work with them on their international website, sound designs, doing UI sound design based stuff. I was, um, picked up on a lot of things from the video game world. And I was like, well, the closest simulation you have is like driving simulation games. So I looked at some of those algorithms in like F mod and I was like, well, how can I recreate this? the driving simulation components of like, like an F mod driving simulation game and then recreate that. Like what are the most important things? And so I sort of took that model and designed my own model, um, using the key. I think I, yeah, I used the Kima system and reactor and I, I started prototyping in max, but then per preferred the sound of reactor. The filters are more smoother. I was looking for something that that was generating like thicker, warmer sine wave and square waves, and reactor was so. Was Jaguar much cars have a reactor patch running inside them. They ha they have well, they don't have a patch, but they have actual synthesized re reactor layers that I designed and Kima additive layers that I used as well. Because but they just end up as like wave files or MP3 they were, files. They were waves mixed with um, a synthesis engine that was also implemented in the car. So there's software that also plays like real time synthesis as well as these layered samples play in mixed in with the synthesis. So to and get sort of what I call- Did you develop the synthesis engine too? Like, did you program that as also? Or? I, I did my, yes, I did. I designed a system that would react to all of the, uh, you know, acceleration, deacceleration of the car. So I had to first des design that first and then I presented that to Jaguar and then they created, recreated a version of that that would run in the car. 
on completely different hardware and software. So they had to basically work from the ground up, but I had to create the, the architecture of it first and present it to them and then be like, this is how we would approach this problem. So the accelerator has like a MIDI signal being sent or something to this engine. Like how does the accelerator send uh, data to this piece of software? Well, the, we designed uh, after multiple iterations of, you know, we, we designed a system that could take MIDI files, like a driving file that you could load in. So you could create a track in the software, say like, what if you wanted to drive through a town or go through a mountain drive, or if you wanted to have a drive where there was like lots of hills or it was just flat highway driving and like we could also like increase the load limit in the software. Like how many people are in the car? Is it a full, there's all four people sitting in the car or only one person in the car that would change the, the load limit on the engine. So the sound would change. There's all these things that would change the characteristic of how that sound would play back in different environments. And so, yeah, cause when you really think about it, we, I, we had to really think about every single situation that you would run into when you're out driving and the most important was like the cycle psycho- for me, it was like psychologically, how would the sound affect people over long periods of time? Like I have to design an EV electrical engine sound. It needs to be pleasant. It needs to do the job of alerting people, the exterior sound and then the interior sound. There were two different sounds. I had to create an interior sound of the engine sound, which was different than the exterior sound. So the but it was speakers also on the inside, just playing sound to the driver. Yes. Is there so an option the to engine- turn that off? You can, yeah. There's de- there's also denoising too. There's like uh, denoising technologies and all kinds of crazy stuff that they added in to the car. Um, so you could change the levels of how loud the perceived interior sound was, hmm. um, but the exterior sound was always was not changed at all. That had to be that was specced in the yeah, legislative doc. Yeah, that was, was like always the whole fixed. point in the first place. <laughs> the whole point, yeah. But <laughs> but, but, but we could fine tune things um, in, in. I'm still curious, like how. Um, like how is the accelerator triggering this piece of software? Cause, um, like, oh, I, I mean, I, I actually had a, I had like a fader pedal. Yeah. But I mean like, so, that. so in the finished product, like if in the cars these days, like how is the accelerator triggering the piece of software? It's tra- it's tracking your movement. It's on this, like, it's like on a X, X, it's like a, I don't know. It's like a, on an axis. I don't and know how to describe it. Is it just it. sending, is it sending just MIDI? Um, in my patch, it was MIDI. Yes. In the, in the actual software, it was, I don't know what, it was a data instruction set that they had. Sorry, my kids are calling me. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> um, yeah, they, they basically converted all of this cause there was no MIDI that was happening in the actual car. It right, was gotcha. all data, basically data driven stuff so just that was connected like, yeah, to the... something that just sends packets and the software just knows how to read said packets and it's like their exactly. own proprietary type of system or something. Exactly. It was completely proprietary. Gotcha. Um, and basically what I had to do was just create a system that they could recreate. Um, gotcha. you know, okay. so they, um, but yeah, sim- mine was simply just using MIDI. Um, I was using, and I was then creating these sort of like MIDI driving files that would test the different engine models at different rates and different speeds to give them more of these, these accurate sim- simulations of what the sound would sound like. And then they would actually test these, these models out and do recordings for me in the actual car. So they would take a B and K d- dummy binaural head system, sit them in the car and drive it out and give me feedback, like with the windows down, then they would do outside recording. So I could hear how loud it was at different distances that we could, um, that we, we could measure, um, so that we're, that it was, you know, cutting through different, um, conditions, say like really rainy days where the wet, where the air was really thick with lots of moisture, um, really cold, windy days. Like a, we had to really test it in almost every sort of, um, you know, during snowstorms or like how well is this sound translating and cutting through um, the air in different environments uh, with wind noise and environmental noise and all the background stuff that you get along with being out in the, you know, in the outside world. Um, so it was, yeah, like I said, it was, it was, it was, there was a lot of thought <laughs> put into the whole, into the whole project piece by piece, but it's, um, yeah, I, yeah, it's, it's a, like I said, it's such a strange job. If you would have asked me 
what I would have been doing like 10 years ago and told me that, hey, I think you're going to be designing sounds for electric cars, I would have laughed and said there's no way. That's- yeah, it seems like the craziest job. Like I've never heard of such a job and yeah, so impressive that that, that is a job. You know? <laughs> um, I, uh, so- I think it's going to become more of a common thing though now that all these vehicles yeah. are like, there's there's like, like this the, race. You're like the forefather of that job. <laughs> Like, I mean, how many, yeah, how many people on the planet like would know how to set up a system like this? I, I don't know. I stumbled through it. And even then, um, and it's funny before I was, before I got hired at Apple, I had, I think like six different companies. I had Porsche, I had Mercedes Benz. Um, they were all knocking at my door. Lucid, wow. who's in, who's in the Bay area. They're, they're another electric car company who, oh my God. um, are doing really cool stuff that I think are going to be on people's radars very soon. They're doing very like high end sort of like the, like Lexus. Uh, if you were to like look in that sort of tier of, of um, electric vehicles doing very beautiful things, they were, they were about to hire me to work on all of their cars before I jumped at Apple. So um, yeah, it's, it's not a field that a lot of people have experience in and even even my experience through it, it was, was like a four to five year thing of us, tr- of doing a lot of trial and error studies and experiments to try to really figure out how we were going to do this. And I remember there was only one other guy. I remember there was another guy that was working at Audi that I would hit up as well. And he, both of us were scratching our heads. We we're like, well, we've got to figure this out. You know, like, you know, and these are like high end luxury car manufacturers. We're not like working with some, we're not designing like a Ford Model T or something. It's just, um, yeah, it's, it's not a pretty like, hard you know, doing sound design for like some small indie game or something like that. It's like, <laughs> it's different. Yeah. This is like, uh, this is affecting like everyday people that'll be buying and driving these vehicles. Yeah. Like, yeah, I worked on plenty of games and things like that, but this was completely out of my, my, <laughs> my realm of what I normally do. Speaking of games, um, like I know you worked on uh, Cyberpunk recently uh, and you also oh, that... worked on Doom uh, and you've worked on like a bunch of cool games. Uh, what, what's the process like for stuff like that? And what was your work like on Cyberpunk? Like what, um, what did you do on that game? Man, I'm going to think back on... It was a bunch of content. I think I did a bunch of loops. Um, I think they, they had me make couple hundred omnisphere patches they were really big omnisphere users and i worked with eric persing and um, diego and a lot of the guys at spectrosonics on the original omnisphere patches the moog tribute patches and a bunch of stuff that's in there um so i was pretty well uh familiar with that synthesizer so that was one of the big ones that they used and they were like hey if you could create a custom library of just patches for us that we could use and these are the different categories that we we want so i designed those first and then um they wanted very specific sounding um sort of i don't know how to how to describe a skeletal like drum beats and stuff like that oh, I, i'm trying to describe it's like textural drum beats that weren't completely filled in it was just like stuff like construction pieces that they could use mm, gotcha um so i went and designed like hundreds of loops and beats and things and um and a lot of stingers tons of sound effects like impact sweeteners and risers and tension builders and like um there were a lot of like atmospheric drones and things and like night city like a lot of the stuff in night city when i was designing and then all the different like s- different varying areas uh within Night City where they, you know, they kind of gave me like a list of things that they wanted. So I kind of went and designed stuff based on those specs. And what was really great was I didn't have to really change much. They were like, hey, we want you to just be you. Do you the stuff like the game is exactly like your sound, (laughs) you know, cybernetic. You know, these people are like modifying themselves or like robotics and like into the future. But it's all like this thrashed like completely decimated world so we want the sounds to be rustic and mechanical and alien and machine like machinery like but they made a strong point that they wanted it to sound like organic like analog they wanted to use analog synthesis as like a the main 
um, the main timbre of the game, like everything would be on, would be made with analog synthesizers. And I said, oh, that's awesome. I, could, <laughs> I don't think I'll have any problems with that. And uh, so I designed, yeah, pretty much everything with analog synthesis, you know, a lot of the sequences and all the drum sounds and everything. I designed everything from the ground up um, with uh, y- using analog synthesizers and, and, uh, oh, sorry here. Do you need to take that? You can take it if you want. Somebody calling for my daughter to play, probably. Oh no, it's all good. It's my do- it's my daughter's friend. They're oh, trying right, to play gotcha. like <laughs> Minecraft or something together on the iPad or something. <laughs> nice. But uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah, that was fun. Yeah, a lot of the games um, I've worked basically doing yeah, basically sound design construction based elements. Like with Mick, that's what I did on Doom. We did, I think it was like a couple of gigabytes of really crazy, um, maybe 12 gigs or 10 gigs of stuff. It was a lot for you, that. <laughs> you mean um, Mick Gordon? Is that right? With Mick Gordon, yeah. Mick's yeah. great. So He's, I actually uh, um, went to his website a couple of days ago and like filled out the form on his website asking him to come on the podcast as well. And he said yes, which is awesome. So I'm really oh, stoked. Oh, yeah, to man. Chat Mick is awesome. Yeah, I'm a massive fan of the Doom soundtrack. It's amazing. Yeah, he's incredible. I mean, if you, if you ask me, Mick is like one of the most incredible guys in the game when it comes to, you know, video game composers world i I feel like he's i mean he really nailed it for doom yeah like doom is i think the most fitting if there's like a a, yeah i think it's like the most fitting soundtrack for that game that could have ever possibly been created oh yeah i mean he he just killed it i worked on uh, another game um with him it was the uh oh what was it called my brain that's how fried my brain is right new new world order was the wasn't like wolfenstein or something wolfenstein sorry yes you're right (laughs) wolfenstein new world order was the game that we worked on before that and that one was really fun too yeah but yeah the the um doom was really fun to work on and with that you know mick was like hey i want to you know if we could make like metal like deranged everything's going to sound like metal you know being bent or distorted in certain ways and um that was just yeah such a fun project to work on because games there's there's really no limit you don't you, they want you to push things as as intense as possible and be you know the sounds can be really aggressive and over the top because every every other game is trying to outdo each other so <laughs> the the more intense and gnarly the sounds are the better so i love that there's no constraint there's no saying no we're just gonna you know mick was like hey just make it sound as fucked up as you can that's that's the brief you know so and I, I was I had, like, that's <laughs> i had no idea that you were involved in the music creation process for doom like i thought it was just all mick so um basically he was like asked to do the music for doom and then he just asked people like you to come on board and try to help him with like some of the sound design in some of the tracks or yep mm-hmm. gotcha. exactly yeah okay yeah i'm yeah, always it was, um, it like interested in how these composition jobs work you know like hans zimmer is a good example of this where he gets asked to score a movie or whatever. And it's like, at the end of the day, not a hundred, like, you know, maybe he's, he ends up doing like 30% of the work or something, but it's more or less like at that level, your job becomes somewhat like a project manager where you just sort of have the overall vision and then you sort of outsource a lot of the work to, to other composers and sound designers and whatnot. Um, not saying that Mick didn't like do a shit ton of work on Doom or whatever, but yeah, I just, I find that, that job role interesting of like, it kind of becomes this project manager type thing. Yeah. I think, I mean, yeah, like you said, I'm sure he, he does a lot. And I'm, I'm, I would imagine there were, there were other people involved in it as well. I didn't know. I I just knew what parts that I was uh, responsible for, but you know, I think on a, on a game that's that big, you work with probably a team. There's probably 30 or 40 people that are working on stuff and different things. And, um, but yeah, I mean the job that I was tasked or, you know, made (laughs) that, that he hired me for was just to get these really, really just like menacing, uncomfortable sounds like i made a bunch of like just just super gnarly stingers and impacts like heavy slams and just like you hear them all over the game just super creepy stuff um you know i made a whole like just like electrical energy stuff too or it's like this evil electrical energy where so i did a lot of like um uh electromagnetic recordings um using like pickups and induction coils and um 
and things like that, where I was just trying to get the most grittiest, gnarliest, like, like electromagnetic recordings. And so I did a lot of experiments with that. And then we did, um, I used like all these different gongs and metals and experimenting with, um, fire recording, fire, (laughs) different things, melting and burning. And, um, yeah, it was super fun. Like I love projects like that where I'm forced to get into like deep sampling, you know, field recording or a combination of like recording and synthesis and sound design and combining all of these elements to create these really like otherworldly spaces and environments with sound. It's just like so exciting to, um, to, to do those things. Cause I, I don't get that, that opportunity that often, unless I'm doing it for my own music. <laughs> um, and what's the process like, like when a job like that lands on your desk, do you, um, sort of like, you know, create a new folder in your, on your desktop or whatever, and just be like, this folder is called doom. And then just like start collecting <laughs> shit and like putting it in that folder and start building up project files in there. Or like, how, what's the process yeah. like for this, something like that? Yeah, for th- I guess the first thing I do is I just listen for stuff. They'll send references, and then um, the brief usually they'll send me. You know, like I like lots of visual references that they can give me. If the game at that point, like when we started working on Doom, they didn't have really much of the game finished it at all at that point, so I didn't really have a lot to go off of. So Mick had sent me a lot of like these storyboards where there was like this imagery of the different scenes and different levels of the game, and. Um, so I could see some of the characters and most importantly, I could see the environments where the, the, the people playing the game would be going through. So I wanted to really capture the essence of like the feel of these places. Like, um, that was most important to me. So, um, by doing that, he also sent some reference tracks, like of stuff that he thought would be like interesting like the like an artist, you know, like I think one of the references was like Ryami and um I think like Alva Noto, like there was different artists that he really liked that they had a certain thing or aesthetic in their music. It'd be really interesting to like take that as- aesthetic and use that in some of the in some of the rhythms or some of the beats and stuff, I created a lot of stuff that he could use at different tempos that were like, once again, like skeletal things that he could layer and construct with. They were like more con- like construction pieces. And so it was a lot of like single sound design based stuff. And then it was like musical element stuff too, that he could use um, that I designed from um, the ground up. And, but I, I left it open enough to where he could layer things and build things off of those pieces. I didn't want it to be completely fleshed out where, he didn't have room to do things, you know, I tried to keep it, um, where it was, it, it was, you know, usable, but <laughs> in the context of how he was trying to build these, uh, pieces in the game. But yeah, yeah. Like I, like it was, it was, like I said, it's fascinating. It's so much fun to work on those projects. And, you know, just like you said, like it, it, it first, um, you know, I, yeah, I set up a folder, get the brief and then I start listening to stuff and then I just start kind of thinking about things about like, all right, well, what do I want to achieve? Like what kind of sounds do they want? What do they want it to feel like? And then I start thinking about what instruments and things I'm going to pull together to create these sounds. And then I start recording, you know, I start recording stuff and, and then it just goes through iterations of processing and then refining and then more recording and then more layering and then processing and stuff until I get stuff in a place to where I feel like it's starting to feel right. And I remember like giving stuff pass after pass to Mick and he'd be like, Oh yeah, this is getting exactly to what I want. You know, Oh, this is it right here. You know, or it's a lot of back and forth, um, you know, of just sending files and stuff and to getting it to, to feel just right. It's like really about the emotion, like getting the feeling just right is the best way I can describe it is really when it comes to, to like game audio, I think it's like, you know, what kind of tension or uncomfortableness do you want the the person to feel at any part of that game? You know, where, you know, whether they're fighting or they're killing somebody or whatever, like the audio and everything also has to intensify based on what the, uh, that person's doing at that, that given time. So it's, it's, it's a tricky balance of being able to design all these pieces that work together that can, that can basically be played <laughs> at that, at that given time in that, that mm-hmm. combination to create that sort of, that feeling of tension or fear or um, excitement 
Um, you know, it could be all of the above, but it's a, uh, yeah, it's tricky. It's just like building with Lego pieces, uh, audio Lego pieces that, that can work in subtle layers or work in complex layers being played with many other pieces. So it's, uh, you think of things in pieces. I think that that's the, that's the gotcha. best way I can describe it. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Um, and when you do a project, say like, um, cyberpunk, uh, 2077, is it? Whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, do you like then go like, all right, cyberpunk, new project, new game, create a new folder, all new recordings? Or do you go like, oh, there was some stuff in Doom that I could reuse for this or some stuff from Doom that like I didn't end up using for Doom that could work well for this or like anything like that? Or is it just like completely fresh slate and new stuff? I fresh slate every time. Oh, wow. I, okay. loved, I love doing everything from scratch every time. Yeah, every project I've worked on, I always do it from scratch. Is that's there a the, certain that's, like an ethos or mentality there? Or? Um, I, I feel if I go into designing something from the ground up with like the idea of what I want, I feel that I, I can achieve it faster than if I'd like go through my library, spend like hours looking for something like, oh, I know I have something that's kind of close to this and then... You know, I'm, I spend like an hour going through thousands of sounds and I finally find that sound. I was like, yeah, it's not quite like what I remembered. And then, you know, I was like, <laughs> well, I just spent two hours. I could have just spent that time just designing the sound that was like close to the sound that I had in my mind. So like I'd run into that many times in the past when I did sound design for a lot of TV commercials and working for advertising agencies where I was like, you know, working under a really tight deadline and you know, was like looking for this one sound to be perfect for this one part in the scene and the, and the spot. And then I was just like, well, I could have just made it. And a lot, 90% of the time when I just made the sound, it ended up being better than the sound that I like spent, you know, an hour searching for through my back catalog of libraries and stuff. So I, I figured out ways of just, you know, and, and when you design something from the ground up from scratch, with that mindset, if you're, you know, trying to achieve a certain goal, like, or they've given you a brief or a direction to go in, you're going to come up with much better stuff that's going to be right in line with that rather than trying to use older stuff to make something fit, at least for me. Um, other people might have a different approach or maybe that has worked out for them if they're doing very similar style music from game to game to game. But for me, it was always been, it was always like a drastic different project where it required completely different sounds and a whole different headspace. So I usually just was like, you know what, I'm just going to start everything from scratch and build everything new. And then it, it's just seemed to be the better way or approach for me at least. Yeah. I guess like, uh, <laughs> there's something sort of special about everything having this artisanal like bespoke quality to it too and it's, it's always like everything's going to be slightly unique and also you have the added benefit of not running into legal issues right like if you made something for doom and then one of the sound design pieces for the contract that you signed was like this is exclusive to doom and like you cannot use this for anything else and then you accidentally pull it into another project and you may be in some trouble exactly so on and so yeah, forth. that's another good reason. Yeah, I mean, because um, usually when I've done those projects, I do buyouts where they just buy all the sounds out from me. And so they own the sounds after that and they can do whatever they want with them. And then, you know, I just kind of keep close that. I just close that folder up and just start new. And and for me, it's fun. I love making stuff from scratch. I love that's the for me, that's the that's one of the most fun parts of my job is like being able to start from nothing like you have a blank sheet of paper okay what's the picture i want to draw what do i want to pay you know what kind of story do i want to tell with these sounds that's like the that's the to me is the most <laughs> that would be taking like all the fun out of it for me if i didn't get to do that um there'd be no reason for me to even want to attempt the job if they didn't want me to build everything from scratch so it's uh i, th I love that challenge and you know you really kind of put all the tools you have to you know to use and um, you know, in I love like, you know, I love having the options of being able to use all these crazy equipment that I've collected over the <laughs> years and being like, put it to like, actually put it into a cool project where I put everything into use where it's like, you know, it, it's like the EOA re metallic resonator right there in the game or like this weird crazy vintage synth or that was a tiny, tiny eyes synthesizer that I used at this part or this, like, it's all these cool little things that I've collected that, you know, they've 
become part of this like legacy or this game that you know this if it has your own little personal touch to it that's like it's just such a cool rewarding thing to hear at the end of the day you know after you've like finished the whole project and it's like out in the world for people to experience um yeah i don't know it's just I don't know, it's a cool thing, you know. <laughs> Have you ever thought about going through all of these old projects and taking maybe like all the offcuts that uh, didn't make it into the games or whatever and like turning it into a giant sample pack or something? Uh, a couple companies have hit me up about that. Um, I mean, it seems like you would just have days worth of oh, yeah, insane I have tons. recordings. And... Yeah, I definitely have a ton. There's been like Soundmorph and a lot of companies have hit me up. I was actually just like, thinking them. I'd be like, dude, Soundmorph would probably pay out the ass for like you. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. They, Jason, they have great libraries, and it's very much yeah, like uh, J- up your alley kind of stuff, like very element. Oh yeah, I've done a couple libraries with Jason um, nice. and them at Soundmorph. I did, uh, I did the modular UI library mm-hmm. with him. Oh, you did some then, presets for uh, that plugin that Rob Clouth made too, right? Dust. Yeah, Rob's. Yeah, Dust plug. The Dust instrument's amazing. And then um, we did the uh, mechanism. I worked on mechanism uh, as well. That makes total like, sense. Yeah, that's the actual pack. I think I was thinking of either that or Elemental. That I think sounds very much like your style. Yep, those were all. Uh, we recorded um, at the. Uh, I recorded those in uh, Montreal, Canada, with the. Uh, the C- the co 100k microphone i brought it up and i think i can't remember if i was playing mutech festival or one of the i was playing a show or doing something up there and i stayed for like four or five extra days and we jason and i we rented out a foley stage and we recorded for like four or five days and recorded tons of gears and watches and ratchets and stuff everything at like 24 192k with this uh the sankin co 100k microphone so this microphone records up to 100k so you're in the range of like hearing bats and insects and crazy things. But this microphone's incredible. They use it at um, BioWare where Jason used to work. He was, I think, one of the lead sound designers at BioWare before he started Soundmorph. And they use this microphone for all the creature recordings. So they record all these, you know, different animals and stuff. And then you would pitch it down with the CO100K uh, microphone because you know, when you have a microphone that can capture the upper harmonics and yeah, the upper detail. It doesn't sound like you uh, lose the all the down. <laughs> It's incredible. Yeah. It's just that microphone's insane. Yeah. I have two of them. That's how awesome they are. Like, What are um, they called? The CO100K by Sanken microphone. CO100K by Sanken? Ken. It's Japanese microphone manufacturer. Oh, yep. Damn, 2500 bucks. Yeah. It's expensive, but yeah, it looks like I'm... if you're if you're into yeah, like uh they're they're <clears throat> absolutely incredible. And I we use the I was using the sound devices recorders with them, the sound devices preamps and stuff I use yeah, quite a bit. They're really nice um, preamps. Oh yeah. I mean the industry standard if you ask me for doing sound effects, but yeah, that microphone's incredible. That uh um yeah, we use that for that particular library. That's what I use singly to to capture all the sounds for all the mechanism stuff or if, like all the ratchety heavy but super detailed too. Like it's got really good high fidelity and um yeah, it's just such an interesting microphone, but yeah, like you said, I I have tons of stuff that I've recorded and uh for those games and and I record stuff all the time. I've even got my wife. My wife records stuff too. She's really, she's actually better at capturing cool stuff than I am. She comes up with some of the coolest uh, field recordings. We did a, we did a, a, an ambisonic library last year for, not last year, the year before for um, Rode microphones for the, uh, for their new ambisonic mic, uh, the NTSF one. And uh, she did, like she helped me out on the project. She, she was just like, she comes up with like the coolest things. I don't know how she, it's, it's great sometimes to have someone that just like thinks about things in a totally different perspective. I remember she's like, all right, what if I took the ambisonic mic and went through a car wash? I was like, it's that'd be idea. cool. <laughs> and it was, so she, she took the van and, and, cause she had the kids and it's like, all right guys, I need you to be real quiet. I'm going to record us going through the car wash. So she recorded it or she brought it home and we have a we have a Dolby Genelec Atmos system in my Studio B room here, um, connected to this room, and we played it back. And I was like, "Oh my God, this is the most menacing, evil sound 
ever. It's amazing. And we send it to the guys at road and they're like, Oh my God, this is incredible. Like, and I was like, yeah, my wife totally just totally came up with this, but she's coming with such cool stuff. Like we recorded our hummingbirds. We put these little DPA miniature omnidirectional mic microphones into, we'd like, they're so tiny. They're like the size of like a eraser pe pencil head. That's how miniature they are. And we like ran them the wire and through into the, the hummingbird feeders. Like, how could we record the hummingbirds? And she's like, why don't we put the, the DPA microphones and fix them into the places where they, the hummingbirds will come up and feed into the feeder. And she did. And we got the most incredible hummingbird recordings and the, those like um, almost sounds like mechanical robots flying like little drones flying into the, uh, uh, into our hummingbird feeder. And she got that. She's gotten some crazy stuff. And, uh, I think one of the most interesting recordings that we had gotten that was, was because of her was, um, we did this, it's on my SoundCloud page. I remember like Aphex Twin and all these people like commented on it. It <laughs> was, uh, uh, a recording of, uh, a burning ember of wood underwater. Oh, we did wow. a hydrophone recording. So we did, we took these hydrophones and dumped them under the water and we were partying on New Year's <clears throat> Eve on this beach and we had a fire next to the beach and we had to put the fire out at the end of the night. And we started throwing some of the, the embers of wood into the water and immediately it made this crazy sound the second it hit the water and my wife was like just like you know steam what? sort of sounds or something it was like <laughs> <laughs> and she was like go get the hydrophones and i was <laughs> like oh yeah so we dunked the hydrophones in and yeah you could listen to it on my soundcloud page i have released the sound for free so people could download it but it sounds like thousands of people screaming in hell it's like wow. completely terrifying and i have so many tabs um, open from this conversation <laughs> that i'm just gonna go through later yeah check it it's uh on my soundcloud page it's like something burning embers of wood underwater and um, um if you scroll down it's probably older but yeah and like soundcloud had posted it like it's like their like the sound effect of the year or something there was some weird thing that they had but it's a uh, um that was oh, yeah, her here idea. we go i found it fifty one thousand plays jeez <laughs> for <laughs> just the sound effect <laughs> yeah must be a good sound yeah uh, but yeah you should check it out because you'll hear like the oxygen escaping through all the holes in the in the wood Gonna and it creates these right really now. really crazy oh wow like yeah that sounds crazy it's, yeah it's, it's pretty gnarly yeah so like yeah it's, it's there's a whole world of just crazy sounds like some of the most bizarre stuff that we've gotten of uh, have been underwater recordings um there's some other recordings up there on my soundcloud too of like dolphins and um shrimp feeding and then um they hypo there's uh sucker fishes in in florida that we recorded that make these sort of like moo mooing <laughs> noises underwater it's a really bizarre recording there too if you check it out there's yeah i have further one down. hydrophone it's um made by cold gold audio Oh, um, cold gold. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's okay. I mean, it's, it was like 30 bucks or something. It's pretty cheap, but yeah. I mean, sometimes those cheap tools, like the, uh, do you know crank sturgeon as well? Oh, crank sturgeon's great. Yeah. They make cool. Yeah. I have like a bunch of these like, like random spring, yeah. metal things and stuff. They're sometimes pretty interesting for getting just random results out of. I like having oh, just absolutely. weird little toys like that for sure. Oh no, that's, you're talking to the guy who loves all those. <laughs> <laughs> So I have one more question and you don't have to talk sure. about this if you don't like, it's like somewhat personal, but it's a story I heard from Tipper. Um, oh, about, Dave. Yeah. About you getting bitten by a spider and then getting oh, on, yeah. on a plane. Uh, would you like to tell that story or? Oh, sure. No. Yeah. Uh, that's funny. Cause me and Dave have very close stories. Cause we both, we both had heart surgery, yeah. which a lot of people don't know about. And I've known Dave for a number of years. I mean, probably going back what 25 years now maybe close to 30 <laughs> years i mean i knew i knew dave back in the fuel days back way way back in the day when he was living in england and we had him play at a bunch of our parties the schematic parties back when we were in miami um and we've been huge fans of dave's music and obviously he's a, been a huge inspiration to me and such an awesome guy and so we share this these these stories of open heart surgery because i had my open heart surgery in 2007 and, you know, like you said, it was from, I got it at the NAM show outside. I was working with native instruments and, uh, I went on a lunch break and 
I had noticed that my ankle was bleeding and it was itching and it was weird. I was like, why is my ankle bleeding? This is really bizarre through my socks. And I was like, I don't remember getting cut or anything like that. And within about three to four hours, I became deathly ill. And at that point in time, I didn't put two and two together that that was, that had anything to do with why I was so sick. I basically got, I was in LA, I was in Anaheim, I was in a hotel and I was DJing for, for native instruments and, uh, I had to tell the, the rest of the people at the Native Instruments booth, I was like, yeah, I can't, I'm totally sick. I'm going to have to like camp out at the hotel until I get better. But my condition didn't get better. <laughs> I got worse and worse. And uh, eventually I had to figure out how I was going to get home. I was like, I got to get home. I, can't. I, had, I also had a show in LA with Basic and a bunch of people that I had to cancel in Hollywood and everything got canceled. I was just like, I got to figure out what's wrong with me. Um, long story short, I get home. My wife picks me up at the airport and was like, oh, you're in bad shape. And uh, tried to camp out with being sick. I had fever chills. I had like a fever of 104, 105, like Whoa. borderline brain damage. Jesus. And yeah, we couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. It was really weird. I had uh, these blood spots in my fingertips that were uh -oh. really painful underneath my fingernails. And then I had gotten so sick. And mind you, um, through this period, we threw a party at our house during this time. I went to Sir, Sir de Soleil with my parents. So I spent nine days with this, this infection that was killing my body when I didn't know that I was dying. Wow. Um, and I got to a point where I got so sick, I couldn't get up off the couch to go to the bathroom anymore. I was so sick. I was delirious. My wife was like, I'm taking you to the emergency room. You're, you're, this isn't right. So... I end up in the hospital. I remember on the going under the way to the ER, I basically passed out. I was 105 temp. I didn't, I woke up in the ICU with all these, um, machines hooked up to me. And my wife was there and she's like, Oh my God, um, you're awake. I'm like, yeah, what's going on? She's like, it's not good. <laughs> you're in ICU. I was like, ICU is not good. Right. And she's like, no intensive care means like it's bad. They want to call your parents. And let them know that you're dying. I was like, oh, so I'm dying, dying. She's like, yeah, you're dying, dying. There's, they've got everything running into you right now to keep you alive because they don't know what's killing you right now. So they're just pumping you with broad, spe broad spectrum antibiotics. It's like steroids and, I was and like, shit. <laughs> just everything you could think of just to stabilize my condition because, you know, if you come in there and they don't know what's killing you, they, they first have to kind of do a bunch of blood tests and, you know, figure out what's in your bloodstream or what's going on with you. So it's like, they kind of just kind of kind of take the numbers and read things and see where things were at. So that's where I, the position I was in. So yeah, I didn't realize that I was dying of a staph infection that had gotten into my bloodstream and it attacked my heart. And through all that, I didn't realize that I had a congenital heart defect. That was, uh, um, you know, I was in an ICU. There was a, a bunch of cardiologists that came. I was like, why are cardiologists here? Why are there heart? Do I've never had a heart problem. I've never had palpitations. I've never had shortness of breath or anything. And, you know, all these years. So it was really puzzling to me that, you know, that they were becoming this was like, how is that making me, how does that have anything to do with me being sick? So it was a, a lot of stuff that didn't make sense to me at the time. But then after looking back on it, I realized yeah, I was dying from a staph infection and I was in cesspus and my body was shutting down. I was like having organ shutdown fa failure at that point. Um, and, uh, and there were clots from vegetations that were forming on my heart valve where the staph infection had attacked and started eating through my aortic valve. <laughs> and uh, because I had a congenital heart defect, that one place that had an insufficient insufficiency in uh is where the infection took advantage of my body and turned into what's called en endocarditis endo endo uh, it, or for short endo yeah but endobacterial carditis is what they call it the scientific medical term is basically a staph infection of the heart lining that attacks your heart that's in your bloodstream and uh yeah for, so from there they had to get rid of the staph infection I spent about a month in the hospital and then I had to have heart surgery. Yep. Yep. Still on it. I'll be done in a few minutes. 
you can have a snack. <laughs> that was awesome. <clears throat> Anyways, yeah. Um, so basically, yeah, like I was saying, long story short, I was in the hospital for uh, close to a month and yeah, basically had to uh, get the staph infection under control before they could fix the issues with my heart. And then I had to have heart surgery to correct all the damage that was done to my heart lining from the staph infection. And the, uh, I was just like, how, well, how did this even happen? And, uh, I remember the infectious disease doctor said, you know, look, anyone, everyone carries staph infection on their fingernails and their nose nostrils. It's everywhere. It's all over your body. And, you know, it happens all the time and healthcare facilities and gyms. It's just, you were just extremely unlucky that this happened. It was just a freak thing. And Unfortunately, it caused a lot of damage because we waited so long to come into the hospital because I, I didn't know what was wrong with me. I would have, you know, had I known that that would have been the outcome, I don't think I would have ended up having heart surgery had I went right to the hospital as soon as I got home from the airport instead of waiting nine days later to do something. So, um, but yeah, so here I am. Now I have a mechanical heart valve. So I actually have a serial number and my heart sounds like a hi-hat it clicks like a hi-hat and wow. uh, yeah so i'm actually part cyborg now for real <laughs> oh man that is a brutal story <laughs> it's pretty brutal some of the stuff that i experienced in the hospital i will say that it was some of the most disturbing um like heart surgery is pretty violent like they kill you for 90 minutes they cut your rib cage open they physically kill you. They put you on a lung bypass machine. There's a machine that pumps the blood for you and does the breathing for you. It is not like a... Oh, man, this <laughs> story is making me so queasy. Oh. Okay, so it's at this point that Bill passes out and the interview is over for all <laughs> intents and purposes. Uh, once again, if you're curious, head over to the Patreon page to watch this all happen in real time on the Zoom recording. I warn you, it is not for the faint of heart. I almost passed out myself when I watched it. Um, so, yeah, use your judgment. Um, but, uh, yeah, one of the perks for being a Patreon member. Anyway, thanks for supporting. Thanks for listening. And we'll catch you next time. Hey, thanks for listening to the Mr. Bill podcast. These episodes are edited and uploaded by Robert Fumo. You can also support the show, get early access to episodes and hear bonus content by going to patreon.com forward slash Mr. Bill's tunes and becoming a patron. Uh, please rate and review on iTunes unless you're going to be a little shit about it. And all the links to my various platforms are at mrbillstunes.com. Thank you. Hello.